ready to get started. Let's go ahead. So I'm going to be talking today about using uh, Apache CXF with WS Security and WS Reliable Messaging. Um, we have an outline with the going over basic policy structure, WS Security Policy Introduction, Attaching Policies, and also looking at uh, WS Addressing and WS Reliable Messaging. Now, what, um, what level of involvement have you guys had in web services and WSDLs and that sort of thing? Ah, okay. Oh, okay. 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 Okay, great. So that's kind of ideal background, actually. Uh, so you already know all the CXF stuff. I won't have to go over any of that. Uh -huh. Oh, good. Okay. Um, well, that's all good to hear. So in that case, there shouldn't be any problem since you already have the background in using CXF. Um, normally, I do this all as part of a three or four day training class that goes from the basics of security on up through uh, you know, WS security and all those uh, different types of options, including direct configuration of WS security. But today we're only going to be talking about the WS policy approach because WS policy is kind of the most um, widely used, it's the most interoperable form of security configuration. So if you're familiar with the CXF interceptor structures, you probably know that you can do direct security configuration using the WSS4J um, interceptors that come with CXF. But the problem is that when you do that, you have to specify everything down to the micro level yourself. And that makes it difficult for compatibility purposes because with different, uh, uh, different people trying to configure their systems to work for, for security configurations, if anything is wrong, it's not going to work. And it's typically very difficult to understand exactly what's going wrong when something you know, breaks on the security front if you've got a configuration error. So WS security policy, well, WS policy in general is designed to avoid the issues with that. So it was originally an industry group proposal. Um, I think it came out of the Microsoft group and uh, some of the other companies that were kind of doing things with them back at the time, 2004. Uh, sometimes called WS Policy 1.0 or the submission version, but the current version is a W3C recommendation. Uh, it has that um, W3.org and WS Policy namespace and officially WS Policy 1.5. You'll see the, the namespace coming up in the documents that we'll be looking at a little bit today. So the purpose of WS policy, as I said, it's a standard for defining the rules of engagement. Um, it's very difficult to configure things like security and have it all come out okay just by setting up everything on the individual operation level. So WS policy is designed to let you configure things like security and do it in a way that will be portable so that uh, if somebody's running on a .NET, you know, WCF system, they can just take the same policy and have it used by their system as you're using on CXF. So basically a way of simplifying things and keeping it from um, avoiding any issues with configuration when you're interoperating across systems. The way a policy is set up is a combination of conjunctions and disjunctions, you know, ands and ors at different levels. And uh, if you remember back to, if you took a logic class in college or something, then you would have had probably, you'll remember the normal forms that you see. Policy also has a normal form, which we'll be looking at in a moment. The policy structure itself is expressed as XML. So you have an XML wrapper around things, and then the assertions are nested elements within the XML. There are three types of policy operators. This WS policy, uh, WSP all, and WSP exactly one. Well, those are the conjunction and disjunction operations. So you have the policy at the root container. Then within it, you have an all element, or you can have an all element, that requires all the direct children to be true. But then you can also have exactly one, which is the or. 
and that says that of the alternatives that are contained within this exactly one, you only have to pick one of those, and it'll work. Now, that's kind of overkill for almost all operations. You see it used occasionally, but um, not that often. Most times, people are working with a policy that just consists of all, and they just give you a configuration that says everything you need to use. The times when you might want to use exactly one and have alternatives are things like, for instance, if you wanted to allow connections to your service that were either using TLS or uh, using message level security with WS Security. So that's a sort of situation where I've seen people use alternatives. Now, since they have that structure of uh, the, the three different components, it can be translated into a normal form where you have a policy element, exactly one, and then some number of all assertions. The way that that works is basically, again, going back, if you remember logic stuff and the, the normal form for equations with ands and ors in them, you can basically translate everything to a bunch of different alternatives that are all composed of conjunctions. Same thing here. This isn't terribly important to understand. Um, it's just a tool that's used by the actual implementations of policy handling to make sense of the policy documents. One of the things that is used for is if the policies, if the ends have different policy you know, choices or whatever available, then they can check to make sure that they are able to meet a policy that's been supplied. All right. Uh, generally, it's easier to avoid some of the nested elements and use what's called the compact form of policy. So with the compact form, you take this whole set of nestings, policy element that contains an exactly one that contains an all with just a WS policy. So these two elements, these two child elements, are assumed if you leave them out. So if you just have WS policy and then you start putting in assertions, it will be considered as though all of those had to be fulfilled together. All right, this sounds pretty confusing. Let's take a look at an example of it. Do I have one here? I don't think I do. Let's, uh, let's bring up something that has an example for you to look at and try and ground this a little bit better in something real. Uh, let's see, what have I got here? Well, here's the policy. This particular one is going to be for signing messages uh, along with reliable messaging. We'll get to the little bit of the reliable messaging stuff later. But for right now, this shows you an example of a policy. Um, let me bump the font up a uh, size here. Let's see. I'm going to go to configuration. No. This one? You're okay? All right. Well, if you guys can read it, I won't bother the tree camp. <laughs> okay. The, the focus doesn't look exactly precise to me. It looks a little blurry, but that's okay. If you guys can read it, that's fine. Uh, okay. So here's the policy element. Now, in this case, I've got the exactly one the all. But what I was saying is that these are really optional. I could pull these out as long as I pull out the corresponding close elements, and everything would be good. Um, This one is actually for, for Metro. So let's go and take a look at the at one of the CXF ones instead. How about uh, um, Chess Quizzle? OK. This one's a really simple policy configuration. So here we have a policy definition. It has exactly one all structure nested elements. Um, and then it has, in this case, an RM assertion. Now we're going to talk about reliable messaging a bit later. But this shows you the structure of the policy document very clearly. You just have the policy thing, and then within it you have some number of assertions. It also has a second assertion here, which is this WSAW using addressing. Now, the namespaces on these are all going to be different depending on the assertion type. So here for the RM assertion, I've got a reference to this RM policy namespace. For the addressing assertion, well, I've got that in a different place, but the, um, that's up here in the addressing namespace. Okay, so this is a policy with two assertions in it. And in this case, it's saying that we're going to be using 
uh, reliable messaging, and we're going to be using addressing as well. What I had said is that these elements can actually be taken out. And generally, I try and do that. I'm not sure why I had them in in this case, because it is simpler and clearer and easier to read the policy when you don't have those, those in there. All right. And you'll often see, as in this case, nested policies as well. Let me mention that in passing. Uh, here we've got the top level policy. That has two child elements, this RM assertion and a using addressing assertion. But then within the RM assertion, there's another policy. This one has a delivery assurance assertion. And within that is yet another policy. So you get these levels of policy nesting that uh, uh, can be kind of confusing. Basically, though, different assertions that you might want to work with in security or reliable messaging or whatever um, will define child policies for their own purposes. In this case, the RM assertion is using this child policy to say what kind of delivery assurances we want to have um, with our reliable messaging setup. Okay, again, we'll talk about that more later. Uh, any questions for right now on the policy? Good question. Okay, who's responsible for enforcing the policy? Well, the way that it works is that um, the yes, you have to have in CXF you have to have policy um, as part of your configuration for CXF. If you have policy included in the configuration, a feature, you know about features in CXF. So if you have the policy feature enabled or you put the policy interceptor into place, either way, um, it's going to be monitoring every operation that you try and do. And it's going to go out and look and see if there's a policy associated with the operation. And if there is, it's going to put in place a bunch of interceptors to actually um, handle that policy. Actually, the way it works is a little bit more involved than that. What it does, the policy engine takes the policy from your whistle document or whatever source it has, and it parses that to see what uh, requirements are there. It passes them off to the individual policy handlers so that, for instance, for security, there's a WS security uh, policy handler. I don't know the, I've forgotten the exact name of it, but basically that is something that the policy engine passes off to. It says, oh, this is from this namespace, so this is the guy who handles it passes off to him. He, in turn, knows how to make sense of the individual uh, assertions in the policy, and he configures the uh, interceptors that are going to be needed for the security handling. Likewise, with WSRM, it's uh, passed off to an RM uh, policy handler. You have to have, you have to, you have to have the policy supplied to CXF one way or another. The most common way of doing that um, is the slide that I was just getting to. Whoops, what happened there? That's not good. Um, okay. Using this policy reference. Now, uh, when you do this, you have a particular element, and I'll show you that in a moment, that links to a policy by name, actually by ID. So you have this WSU ID attribute value um, that comes from this old security namespace. And that identifies a policy that you want to use on your document. So let me go back here. And we saw in this case we had this RM policy. So if I just do a search on that in here, using JEdit, um, Come on. Here's a policy reference. And all that says is, is just this policy reference element from this uh, policy namespace. And it says URI equals uh, pound sign RM policy. Well, that's a standard reference. The, um, the pound sign, the hashtag, whatever, is saying that it's in, internal to this document, just like a, you know, on an HTML page or anything. 
Um, so it's saying that this is a policy that's defined within this document. The URI is going to look for something that's defined in a particular namespace, this WSUID. So that's how it's associated. Um, you can also have policies that are external to the, whist, uh, to the WISDL document. So you don't have to have the policy embedded in the WISDL, though it is the most common case and the most convenient for most purposes. You can also dynamically attach a policy at runtime. So in your client code, you can, uh, you can actually uh, attach for a particular call if you wanted to a particular policy. Now, policies can attach at different places. I think I have a slide in that, but since we have it up here now, I'll just mention that when you have a policy reference at this level, it applies to all the operations defined by this binding. Um, you could also have the policy defined at the service level, and it would apply to everything in the service. Um, you can also have it defined at the operation level or even at the input or output level. So you have a lot of granularity when you're working with policy. You can determine which particular operations uh, the policy is going to be used for. Now, the only restriction on that is that there are certain types of policies that are supposed to be attached at particular levels. And if you, uh, if you attach them at the wrong level, they may not always work correctly. I think I have that in the slides, though, so let's go back to the slides and continue on from there a bit. Uh, I've got to set my, change my setting here. Sorry. Let me go do that so that it won't keep taking me back to the beginning every time I stop. Well, maybe not. I know there is a setting in here somewhere to uh, tell you whether it always starts up from the beginning or continues on from where it was, but I don't know where offhand. Damn. All right, well, maybe what I'll do is just I'll stay on this page anyway. We don't really need to go to full screen. Okay. If you don't mind all the wiggly lines. Um, so WS security policy. WS security policy extends WS policy with security assertions that are using, um, well, they're defined by this organization, uh, used to be OASIS. It's actually been absorbed now. No, that's right. It is still OASIS on this one. There are three versions in use, the 1.1, 1 1.2, and 1.3. Now, 1.1 is the older one. It's not really recommended that you use it so much anymore. Uh, it doesn't have the full range of options that the later ones do, and everybody at this point supports the later ones. Um, 1.1 1 .1 or 1 1.2 and 1.3 are essentially the, the same. 1.3 just has some minor extensions to it. So this is actually the namespace that you're going to be seeing most of the time on policy on security policy documents. All right. Neither one is compatible with 1.1. Uh, CXF works fine with both, so you don't have to worry about that. But if you're defining documents, it's better to use the 1.2, 1.3 combination. Now, the um, structure of security policy is really complex. Um, there are all these different assertion types. There's 140 different assertions defined. Some of them are simple. Some of them have nested policies, as we saw with the WSRM one. So the um, it is very complicated to, to try and understand how they can all fit together. One of the nice things about policy is that you can generally find examples that are already structured correctly to use. I'll go into that in a, a little bit later in the slides as well, and we'll discuss some of the examples that you can go to so you don't have to try and make up everything by yourself. There are rules for which assertions can go where, so you can't just jam all the assertions in together. They have to be nested in particular ways. And um, uh, you can't even use a schema for the purpose of looking at it because uh, schemas only work in one namespace. And this goes across namespaces back and forth. So it, it makes it pretty, pretty useless. CXF does a good job of verifying, especially these days. Um, Colm put a lot of work into the 
uh, WS security policy handling so that it does uh, a thorough job of verifying that it knows how to handle the policies. And if it doesn't know how to handle something, it will warn you. That's particularly true in the 3.0 uh, code that, that's coming out very soon. It's uh, been backported, a lot of it has been backported to the 2.7 series, but um, the 3.0 is going to be even better on that. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, it's already pretty usable. It's been in the, uh, um, I don't know what you call it, early access releases or whatever. Yeah, milestone drops. Um, but the official release is targeted for the end of the month. Okay. So, first policy we're actually going to try working with is this username token. Um, so, username token is about the simplest security thing that you can do. All it does is it puts a token, as it's called, into your message uh, so that your, your actual messages will go into the server from the client and have some identification and you know, verification information included in it. And that consists basically of a username and uh, optional password that you can include in this token that gets sent into the server. So that's what we're going to look at first. There are different options that you can have, like no password or hash password or nonce and created and all that, but we're just going to go with a simple one. Um, now to configure security, you can configure it in code. Uh, it's easier to use Spring in general, though. And the configuration file should be loaded automatically if it's in the class path and names cxf.xml. You can also load it directly, though. And I'll show you examples of both. I think the way your code is set up that I gave you and the uh, key there, the, um, it'll have the cxf.xml file already in place for you. Client configuration. Okay, well, for, for most of the configuration stuff, you can use the JAXWS standard um, configuration file format. And that has a JAXWS namespace with client uh, element to say about the client that you're going to create. And in this case, we're going to be creating clients for this library namespace. And um, we're going to supply it with certain policy or certain properties that are going to be used by the code. Now, in this case, I have it set up, or I'm, I'm showing in the slide that we have a ws-security.username with value libuser and a ws-security callback handler with name and it goes on for a while here. It's basically this uh, password handler in my library SOAP client class. So what that's going to do is it's going to configure the JAXWS properties for this client endpoint with these values. The WS security code in CXF looks for these particular values. These are you know, well-known names to the security code and uh, uses the values to determine what to put into the message. In this case, it's going to use this username value for the username for a username token, and it's going to use this callback handler to get the actual password value that's associated with that username. Now, there are different ways of doing this. I could configure this directly in code rather than putting it into the properties file. I could... Uh, Okay. So if we found that doing a programmatic configuration of endpoints or clients is a lot better than stuff, so would you say for you to be a code, do you mean at that level or do you mean at the actual client invocation level? At the actual client invocation level, yeah. So uh, for most people, they prefer the, the spring configuration, so that's the way I have your example set up. Sure. But I'll go ahead and show you as well the other alternative. Oh, okay. Well, you could do that, but it's easier to just configure it directly in your code, I think, if you're going to do that. CXF has, one of the really nice things about CXF, as I'm, I imagine you know since you've been working with it, is that it gives you such flexibility over configuration. You can use Springer Blueprint for the configuration files. You can uh, configure stuff directly in the code. Um, yeah, you can use interceptors to tweak stuff along the way. Too many options to enumerate. Okay. So uh, that shows you the simple client configuration. The service configuration is pretty much the same. 
except for the service, because username tokens only go in one direction. They only go from the client to the server. Um, the service just needs to know how to validate a username token that it receives. So in this case, I'm supplying it with a callback to handle that uh, validation. Now, I'm not sure how you'd, I guess for the service, you would have to configure this using those spring objects. I haven't tried that myself, so I don't know how you'd even do that. Well, but it's, it's, it's almost exactly the same as the XML. Uh huh. You're just um, using the object. All right. All right. So what I have here is uh, assignment code to actually get you guys to, to try it out yourself. Um, you can run the assignment code with original WSDL first, which doesn't have any security in place, then change to library-ut.wisdl. Uh, change the annotation on the service implementation uh, because the service implementation points at the WSDL and change last argument to the client and add required values. Well, let's go through that. Let's take a look. If you look at that code that I gave you, let's see, I'm going to, what do I want to do here? Start another instance? Yeah, I'm going to start another instance of Eclipse to go to the class code, I think. Yeah, if you expand that, uh, that file I gave you. Actually, we're going to run directly. Well, you can if you want to uh, uh, go instead to, uh, it, the code is set up to generate a war file. So you can generate a war file and deploy it. Let me show you how it runs, though, if you do uh, have it going directly to, you know, running directly. Even though I'm using Eclipse, it should be very similar in. Uh, I just, uh, okay, well, let me just show you how, uh, you know, my recommended way of doing it, and then you can do it however you want. So uh, let me import the projects here. Well, let's see, do I have. Okay, why am I getting complaints here? Oh, okay. Yeah, I'm sorry. It's Maven uh, build, and I gave you the unbuilt project. So before you do anything else, you should build it. Um, now, um, if you don't have the stuff in your system, it'll take a few minutes to do that as it downloads things. So why don't you go ahead and get that started? I, of course, already have everything on mine. For actual training classes that I do for people, I set it up so that they're working off my, you know, local Maven Nexus in instance, but, uh, yeah, I know. That's why I didn't bother trying to set up anything like that for this one, and since there's only two people anyway. But if in a class of 10 or 12 people and, uh, you know, working over a shared wireless and they try and run Maven builds, it gets messy. <laughs> okay, and uh, the way the project structure, I may as well mention about that since we haven't. Uh, gone through the project structure. You've got the four separate modules in there. Uh, the common module is for generating the, the code from the WSDL and that sort of thing. Uh, that's all it handles. Now in our case, we're going to be working with the same code for all the different policies, 
and so we don't actually need to regenerate anything. When you use policies with CXF, um, none of the policy information goes into the generated code. It's all set up at runtime, so you don't have to worry about uh, you know, regenerating the, um, the code for the, the WSDL just because you're changing the policy. So the common module has the actual generated code in it. The service module has the service, the client module has the client, and the war has the, the war file construction. But if I go into the service module um, and look at the library SOAP impl, well, this is just doing a simple library example. The actual implementation of the library is in this book server class, and it's just a very uh, simple static library of, um, of books that just has, uh, I don't know, a half dozen or so books in it and um, allows you to <coughs> retrieve books and add them and all that sort of thing using the web service. So library soap impl is the actual implementation of the web service. Now down at the bottom of it I have a main method. You can run this main method directly in order to actually do operations. Now you would be familiar with this. I'm just configuring a CXF bus here with logging interceptors and all that. So I initialize the bus from the uh, cxf.xml, I uh, add logging interceptors, and then I go into loop and wait for things to shut down. So if I run this guy, it'll go through a bunch of stuff and then say type enter to exit. Okay, so it tells me it's uh, running on this localhost uh, 1379 library dash ws pal. All right. So now I can run the client, and let's see, I think for the client, I need to pass a few parameters. So I'm going to first say debug as Java application, and it'll tell me what I need there. What the heck? Oh, I didn't tell it the file name here. Let's go to there. <coughs> okay. It was actually set up properly and everything, so you don't need to pass any parameters. It uh, goes to the server, it retrieves some books, and uh, adds a book and all that sort of thing. Now, if I go back to the server console, let's just take a look at what actually went on there. Um, you can see the messages in the logging output from the server. So I have this all get all books call and then the message returned from the server has all the book information in it. Um, I have a get book call, and then it has a get book response with the get book information returned. Um, get types, which returns the types of books in the library. And then finally an add book, and uh, another get books by type to make sure the added book shows up. So the client just runs through that sequence of operations. Now again, you can do this however you want. If you want to deploy it to the server, um, you should be able to just run the Maven build and it'll give you a war file that you can then deploy to your server. But it is generally pretty easy for development to just run that, um, that server directly in your, your IDE. It's uh, library soap in, uh, yeah, library WS pile service library soap impl is the class. And that's the main method. All it does is it, it configures CXF using the cxf.xml file and sets up the loggers and then goes into loop. So I gave you the code all set up to just run the basic service without any security, and then we'll go back and add in the, change the whistle that has a security policy in it and try that out. I'll give you a minute to give that a try. Let me know if you have any problem or anything. Oh, the, um, the URL that the client is set up to expect 
is uh, this one. Actually, it's less readable that way in there. So it's localhost 1379 library dash WSPOL. If you're going to deploy to your, you know, to uh, Tomcat or something, you can change that in the client. So the client code, if you look at the client code, it, uh, that's right. Well, no, I don't have it hard coded. I'm passing it in as parameters, aren't I? Oh, I gave you an Eclipse configuration for it, though, and you guys aren't using Eclipse, so that doesn't help much. Yeah. Here, let me show you the parameters I'm passing into it. Okay. So the WSDLs are in the common module, so this has a relative path to the WSDL from the client. Yes. No. The, the library is so pimple. Let's go back to that for a moment. Um, here's library so pimple. So you can see what I'm doing. I'm configuring the CXF bus with logging interceptors and all that, and then I just enter a wait loop. So how does the service actually get run? Question for you guys. Yeah, um, the way it works is you can you can manually start an endpoint in CXF. So I could, if I wanted to, just create an instance of this um, library soap pimple class and run it directly, or you can um, use the bus to define it. So I'm in this case defining a bus structure in the CXF.xml, and the bus structure just has this endpoint for library soap pimple. So when I create the bus, it automatically starts running this service. Okay, so that's how the uh, how the service is is working here. I, I started up uh, by just creating the bus, and that takes care of everything. CXF starts up and it deploys the the service automatically. So okay, that's why I'm saying this is the simplest way for development purposes to run things. Uh, but you're you're fine doing it in Tomcat as well. The only problem with redeploying it and you know using wars and going out to Tomcat is that you generally have to restart Tomcat after a couple of times because it runs out of uh, a perm perm gen memory. So it. Uh, okay. All right. Okay. All good. Okay. Yeah. It's just a matter of preferences. Yeah, my, my preference is probably separate based on how. All right. Sure. All right. So here's that client configuration. Uh, you guys got it running on your? Um, you can run on a terminal. You can run on your IDE, whatever you want to do. I'm not sure. The Maven project might even have it set up as a target there. Generally, I do that. I'm not sure if I did in this case or not. Uh, so if we go to, let's see. No, I guess I didn't this time. Sorry, I should have done that. Yeah, so however you want to start it in, uh, in your setup, it's the library SOAP client class and these are the parameters that you pass to it by default. If you're going to a different path, if you're going to Tomcat or something, you just change that here. So it's host, port, and path. Okay. It's getting them all from the Maven configuration. The Maven, it's a Maven project build. No, it's a Maven project build, standalone Maven project build. Uh, yes, the, well, no, it's using Maven dependencies. Uh, I know IDEA works well with Maven dependencies, so you should be able to just import the project into IDEA. 
Um, Okay. Okay. So my question is very simplistic. So you want me to see something working on my computer or be able to have it? All right. Uh, well, it would be good for you to be able to try this stuff out because it helps set it in your memory. This is a tutorial rather than just a lecture, so it's nice to run through it. What I will do is I will set this up quickly as a, in the POM file, I'll add a target for the, hell, I can add a target for both the client and the service, and you can just uh, run it that way. Is that? Yeah, that would actually be helpful. Okay. Then it doesn't matter what environment you're Sure. <clears throat> okay. It is actually set up already in the client. So in the client, uh, it is there for you to be able to run it. And if you're deploying to Tomcat anyway, then that's all you really need, I guess. So the one thing that you need to do then is pass the information to uh, Maven about the project to execute. And let's see, I've got the code around for that in dozens of places if I can just find one here quickly. I always forget that uh, Maven structure with the PL parameter that you pass to it. Here we go. So Maven, so it's going to be Java run. Oh, shoot. Let me look at a Java project here. Um, anybody remember how to execute a Maven? Executable target? See, I don't have it on the slides, I guess. Give me just a moment here, sorry. Okay, so it should be Maven exec. Oh, client, I need one more thing in there. It's a com Sosnowski sec class, S-E-C-C-L-A-S-S, -S, library soap client or in the other case. Yeah, again, the Maven project has those arguments in there, so you can just see it from there. The, the prom.xml in the client directory. And I'm just trying to figure out why this didn't... Uh, yeah, I know, I'm just trying to figure out why it didn't here. Let's see if I do... See, I tried doing this, but it didn't pass the parameters. Maven exec Java PL client. Uh, exec Java PL client. What the hell am I missing? Yeah, if you just specify the module, that should be okay. Give me one more second here. I think I know where to find this information. Uh, D launcher, is that the option? No, shoot. Huh.
All right. Sorry to be wasting time on this. Um, Okay. That's true. All right. Well, let me go ahead and demonstrate the stuff for you anyway then, and we can uh, just run through it that way. So going back to uh, my setup here and uh, just using that, um, I had for the assignment to uh, run the assignment code with original Quizdle and then change this library-ut.wizdl. And I say change annotation on service implementation, change last argument to client, and add required values to the XML configuration, first client and service to make it work. All right, so let's go through and uh, take a look at those steps. The first thing I want to do is change the WSDL that I'm using. So in the client, the WSDL is a passed in parameter. So since I'm running it in Eclipse, I'll just change it in Eclipse. And I'll change that to be the library WSDL dash UT. So instead of just library WSDL, I have library dash UT WSDL. So that's step number one. Now if I just ran the client like this, now that it has that library UT WSDL, I'm going to get failures because it's going to try and put something into the, the message and it's going to fail. So as you can see here, I got uh, an exception. Um, Well, okay, I, didn't, I stopped it too soon, so it didn't actually show us the exception. Let's go through it one more time. <coughs> uh, so fault exception, okay. And the message is, let's see, uh, must understand headers. Well, it says that uh, the security are not understood. Well, what happened here is if we go out to the message, the client generated a message using the uh, security headers for this username token. And you can see that in the message here. In fact, let me make it bigger. The server, though, is still using the old whistle, So it doesn't recognize it. And it correctly sends this SOAP fault saying that it had a must understand header that it doesn't know how to handle. So uh, here's the header that you know, actually went out with the username token. In this case, it has the username libuser and this password books as just plain text. Uh, but on the server side, it rejected it. Now, I can switch to the server's log as well so we can see what the, well, actually, that is a server log that we're looking at there. On the client side, it just gets a, a fault, and that's all that we see. Okay, so I changed the client without changing the server. And because of that, it sent in the message, but the server doesn't know how to handle the security, so it uh, bombs out. All right, let me stop the server now. And this time, I'll reconfigure the server to work with it. So the easiest way of doing that, or the way that I'm going to do it in this case, is to just change the WSDL location in the service definition. So up at the top of this library soap .java, there's this whole web service annotation, the JAXWS annotation, that gives you all the configuration information about the service. Now, you don't have to configure everything in here. Basically, the, um, the spring configuration that we looked at earlier, the CXF.XML, is an alternative to anything on the service itself. So you can configure your service using annotations, or you can configure it in the cxf.xml, or any combination of the two. Now in this case, it was easier or cleaner for me to just put the annotations in here to do it. So if I change the WSDL location here, I should now be able to run the, the service and have it take off. Now the other thing is, I may be missing some of the properties necessary. I'm not sure if I had them all in there. Let's take a look. I had it commented out in the cxf.xml file. So I'm also going to uncomment. Well, actually, I guess I've got everything I need for right now. 
I have a server callback that's being called. So let's go ahead and restart the server. And if I run the client again now, this time it should hopefully work. Okay. Uh, did it make it all the way through? Let's see. Yeah. Yep, let's take a look at it. So let's go, go through this in a little bit of detail. Now that I've demonstrated it for you, um, let's go ahead and look at what's actually going on behind the scenes and everything. So the policies are all in the common module. So if I go into source, main, resources, model, I have library ut.wisdl. I guess I didn't give you the other ones yet. I'll have to put those in there as well. So library-ut.wisdl. This one has a username token policy. And all that does is it has this security policy supporting tokens element or assertion. Within that is a nested policy that says the supporting tokens is just going to be a username token. All right? So username token is what I talked about in the slides. It's um, you know, the token that just gives you the information about a user and a password. It says always to recipient. What that means is we're always sending it to the server. Now for username token, that's really the only configuration that makes sense. For other types of tokens that we're going to see, you might have a different alternative here rather than always to recipient. It could be some, some other setting that we'll look at. So this policy right now is just enforcing the presence of the username. Yes. But it's mostly identification and Exactly. That's true. Only the most basic form of authentication because it just has a plain text password. So, so okay. this would only be secure if you were using it over HTTPS. So, okay, but the request you make when you, ch when you change the whistle uh -huh. in your annotation and you sent a message, I didn't see any password to ask. Okay. Well, let's take a look at how this is referenced here. I mentioned how you don't have to, you can put the policy reference in at different places. Let's take a look at that. Uh, well, okay, in this case I do have it in the root of the, document. I was thinking I had it elsewhere. That's interesting. Am I in the right place? Yeah, I guess I am. So. Um, it should be going on every request. I thought I only saw it on one of the requests, so let's take a look at that and make sure of what's going on. So if I look on the server where I had the logging going on, let's go all the way up to the start. And uh, the very first message that came in, okay, yeah, it is on all of them. So here's the first message. It's a get all books request. And there's the header that has a security token in it, the username token. And you can see it's just lib user and books as a password. There's nothing in the outbound because username token is only being sent from the client to the server. Yeah. Uh, okay, so can we back up just a moment? Sure. So when you configured the client to express the security header, uh -huh. um, I only saw in the policy where you had the username assertion. Now, does that imply that there's a password as well, or do you have ah. You have, uh, you have options with that. Um, if you go back to the slides, I mentioned in there about, uh, well, somewhere in here, username token. Um, nested policy assertions define the format. So you can have no password or hash password um, as nested policy assertions. So if I want to change that, let's go ahead and, uh, and do that. Yeah. Oh, come on. Up in the top. Here we go. It's the default. It's the default setting. So um, let me go ahead and bring up the document. Uh, we'll, we'll delve into it as necessary then. So I'm going to bring up the WS Security Policy 1.3 specification here. 
This is kind of a heavy duty document. This is the actual standard that defines those 140 assertions I mentioned. Um, if we look in, in here though, you can find details of all the different assertion types, including username token assertion. So I'm going to go to that one. Here's the username token assertion, and this gives you the actual format of it. Okay? So we've got username token. Uh, it gives you options for issuer and issuer name and this sort of thing. It gives you an option for claims that we're not going to use. And then it has a nested policy document. Within the nested policy, you can have other components which include no password. So let me try doing that. <clears throat> so, you want to watch what I'm doing on the change here? I'll go ahead and tweak this. So rather than an empty policy element, I've now got a policy element. I'll plug in the SP no password. And now if I run those guys again, Restarting both the client and the server. Well, let's do the, let's just do the client alone. Uh, wait, wrong, wrong one here. So let me try running the client again now. And I get an exception. Well, let's take a look at what happened here. It says uh, security token could not be authenticated or authorized. Exactly. Yep. So now if I restart the service, it will pick up that modification as well. Let's go ahead and do that. Okay. And this time it ran through without a problem. If we look at the uh, logging of messages on the server, we can see that it's now doing a username with token with just the username. All right. Now, is this, uh, is this working for you? I'm not sure. What's your name? Stacy. Stacy? Yeah. And, and your name is? Matt. Matt. Okay. So is this working for you, what I'm doing and going through? Okay. Well, let me know if... Uh, you know, if I'm going through anything and you want more details, uh, like I said, we'll just do this interactively since you guys are yeah, sure. only two of you. All right, so that shows uh, the username token stuff. Now, what's actually going on behind the scenes? This is uh, worth looking at just because we'll be using some of the same stuff for the later examples that are more complex. So let's take a look at um, uh, what's going on on both ends. On the client side, you can configure the username token in different ways. I showed you that in this case, I've got it partially in the XML configuration with this uh, CXF.XML where this has a callback handler. Oh, well, it defines the username right here as libuser, and then it defines a callback handler for um, actually getting passwords at runtime. Now, this is kind of the preferred approach in general because that way you don't have to hard code your passwords into configuration files and that sort of thing. So you instead use a runtime callback, and that runtime callback can do whatever you want. It can you know, get it out of a database, it can get it out of any other kind of configuration file you want. It just needs to know how to get it. If we look at the actual callback in the uh, library SOAP client class, here's what it looks like. It has a password handler that implements a callback handler interface which is a functional interface in Java 8 terms. So, gee, we could do this with a, uh, <laughs> with a Lambda, uh, but probably not. In any case, um, we've got a set of callbacks that we're supplied with by the security code, and it's our job to go through those callbacks and to do something appropriate with each one of them. On the client side, the only ones that we're going to pay attention to, well, right now it's only the username token. And when we see libuser is the ID, we're going to set the password to books. So that's how it would work. If you had different users, you could use different passwords here in the client, whatever you want to. We're going to then be using this the other part later. So I'll discuss that again when we get to that. On the server, 
we have another callback. This time I put in a separate class, but same principle. So the server callback is taking the same sort of callback array, but when it gets a username token uh, callback, it's going to check and verify the password. Um, and the way it does it is it sets the password in here, and then the actual CXF code verifies that the supplied password matches. Okay, so that's it for username token pretty much. Any questions? All right. So, let's see, going on from there. Binding assertions. Um, binding assertions in security policy define the usage of crypt cryptography. So encryption and signing, all that sort of thing, uh, it says that you're going to be using that. There are three forms of binding assertions that you can use in WS security policy. Transport binding is if you're just going doing uh, transport layer security. So you can say that you need to use HTTPS. You can say that it has to be a specific um, token, that sort of thing. Yes. Yes. I, I believe that works. I haven't actually verified that it rejects it, but I believe it does. It's supposed to. I can't imagine Colm would leave that out. Um, if we go and take a look at the security policy definition of this guy, so I've got the security policy uh, OMA up here, and let's see, we're looking for binding assertions. Where are we here? Transport binding assertion. All right, so those are the options that you have on the transport binding. You can have a transport token assertion that actually defines uh, a requirement for the transport token. Let's see, what are the ones that you can do for that? It doesn't tell you. Huh. All right. Well, you can specify the algorithm suite that's supposed to be used. Now, I'm not sure if CXF actually enforces that. In theory, you should be able to say that, for instance, you want to use, um, oh, I don't know, CBC, uh, AES with CBC um, locks or whatever, or you know, more likely GCM if you want to be more secure. So you could, in theory, at least specify the algorithm suite that you're going to use. Um, I'm not sure that CXF actually enforces that, but I think it does. You now you can also say include timestamp. Uh, to just say that you need to include a timestamp in the messages. I'm not sure what the point of that is if you're going over TLS anyway. But those are the options that you have. Right, so, but this style of assertion is, is I guess, in the stack, it's above or above that, but it's beneath your service. It is in a sense, yeah. Right. It's how the actual connection is being made to the server. So, um, CXF does allow you to get at those, that information, I believe. I know you can get at the token that's, you can get at the certificate, for instance, that's being used for the connection. Right, right. So I guess, you know, we are accustomed to running the CXF organic container. Uh-huh. So many of these containers um, in our world, I guess, are being forced by the container. But I yes. guess, for example, when we're starting up CXF servers as standalone applications, uh -huh. this Well, it's still relevant even when you're running in a container um, because, for instance, you might allow uh, people to connect and you say you want to have a secure connection, but that can either be using TLS or it can be using message level security. So uh, CXF needs to be able to get the information from the container, what type of connection is being made. And I believe it does that with Tomcat. I mean, uh, I know you can get at the certificate that's being used and all that sort of thing, so it should be uh, available. Um, so it's something I haven't actually checked, but as far as I know, CXF does enforce the, the policy of transport binding even when you're running it in a container. Okay, um, so transport binding is the simplest one. Now, asymmetric and symmetric bindings are where you're going to be using uh, more serious cryptography directly. Asymmetric binding is for a public-private key pair. So, that's where you have keys and certificates that you're going to be working with. Symmetric binding is for a secret key. Now, normally the secret key has to be secured by a certificate, at least from the server. 
and we'll get to, to that so you can understand the, the options there. Um, nested policy for child assertions, and some of the common ones are algorithm suite and um, include timestamp, as we saw for the, the transport binding one. Now, algorithm suite is often used and almost always used, in fact, with the asymmetric binding and symmetric binding. I'm not sure if it is enforced with the transport binding, because if you're running in a container, you don't necessarily have that much direct control over the algorithm that's going to be used by the container. So I'm not sure how that's uh, enforced in CXF. But the asymmetric binding, symmetric binding, the algorithm suite definitely is. So transport binding, um, just having transport binding assertion present means that secure transport is required, or at least that, that assertion is uh, for uh, secure transport. Uh, child assertions are you know, not terribly useful in this case. Asymmetric binding is used for asymmetric signing and encryption. Well, that's the public-private key pair. Uh, you have child assertions to define the actual usage of things. Um, the way that this works is you can define separate tokens for use with signature and encryption, or you can use the same token for both. Now, in cryptography terms, it's often um, recommended that you do use separate uh, separate tokens for signing and encryption. But in practice with WS Security, I've never actually seen that being done. Everybody uses the same key and certificate, you know, private key and certificate for both purposes. Um, what actually gets done behind the scenes is you're using symmetric digesting and encryption anyway. It's just that the, the secret key for the symmetric encryption is transported using the certificate and, uh, and private key. And we'll get an example of that and look into how it actually works in the messages. So you have initiator token um, and recipient token. Well, initiator token is the client. The client is the one that initiates an exchange. So it's, uh, that's saying that you're specifying some token to be used by the client. Recipient token is for the server, uh, whoever is receiving the messages. And that's specifying something about the security token, the certificate that they're going to be using. Um, OK, other child assertions define usage. Let's take a look at what we have here. All right, client configuration. Well, this shows an example of configuring the client um, for working with asymmetric encryption, for, for working with a, a private key and certificate. So we have to set up a client crypto. We, we have to set up signature properties, and we have to set up encryption properties. What these actually are, um, if you are working with separate key and certificate for encryption versus signing, then you can specify two separate sets of property files for them. In order to clarify what I mean by that, let's go back to the uh, yeah, let's go back to our code here and take a look at the client configuration. This already has stuff in place. Yeah, I don't know if we're supposed to take a break. I guess we'll take a quick break in a few minutes here anyway. Um, all right, so here I had a comment out in the code that I supplied you. I'll just go ahead and uncomment that now. But let's take a look at what's actually in here. We've got JAX-WS properties, the username and callback handler we'd used before for the username token. The ones I uncommented now, though, are the signature properties and encryption properties. Now, the properties file itself is just defining, it's referencing a standard properties file. In this case, client crypto properties. Now, I use the same one for both because I'm using only a single key and certificate for both signing and encryption. If I was using separate ones for signing and encryption, I would need uh, uh, two separate uh, things there. So if I go to the client crypto properties, it just has a provider, a key store type, a key store password, and a, uh, the actual file name that you're, you have the data in. 
So you guys worked with JKSs before or, or key stores of any form? Okay. Key stores are just a modestly secured way of organizing uh, certificates and, and private keys. You have a password on the key store that basically encrypts everything in the key store itself. Yes. Yeah, yeah usually change it is the, the standard one. I go with no secret. That's the <laughs> but uh, as you can see here. So you have a, a password for the key store that basically encrypts and decrypts everything in the key store. It's symmetric encryption. If you have a private key stored in there, then you have a separate uh, password for that private key. So there's like a double layer of protection when it comes to private keys. Now, in your configuration, you're always going to have to have your own private key along with your own certificate in the key store. And you're also going to have to have the certificate for whoever you're going to be talking to in general. There are exceptions, though. Um, for the service, you can tell it to just use the client certificate that the client sends into it. So that's one way of doing things. But in general, you're going to want to have the certificate for the other end in your key store as well. Um, OK, so that shows you the client properties, the configuration properties for crypto. If I go back to the, the slides here, uh, anything else of interest? Service configuration, it's very much the same. Uh, we have server crypto properties um, as the configuration file for the server. If I go into the code, I think I had properties comment out there that need to be on command for this to work. So if I go in there now, no, it's the uh, CXF, yeah. I'll just uncomment these properties I already had in place in the file. <coughs> All right. Now, if I try uh, changing to a policy that actually has encryption in place, I should be able to demonstrate it. Let me go through the slides, though. Is there something else? OK. Change to library ASIM sign encrypt uh, whistle. Well, I don't think I actually gave you that in the class. Well, I'll do those. I'll just drop these in a uh, local directory. I'll put them on the USB key once we're done. Um, so let me get the, find the code for that. That's strange. I thought I had them all in here, but I guess I don't. So let me find the other policies I want to work with. Okay, I'm adding into the, uh, that directory. I've added a new file in there now, which I'll just run through the example of. It's library asim sign encrypt wisdl. All right, what this guy's going to be doing is using asymmetric, asymmetric binding, as you can see here. Now, asymmetric binding in security policy terms is where you're using a public-private key pair to do the uh, you know, securing of the connection. And the public key is going to be in the form of a certificate, while the private key is something that you have to have stored in your, your own private key store. Um, okay. The initiator token in this case, why is that never? Okay, it's supposed to be never. Um, the initiator token in this case is going to be something that um, uh, we get out of our, our key store. It's going to be the one that we're using as the signing property uh, for our configuration. The recipient token is going to be the one for the server. And in this case, it says that both of these 
we're not going to send in either direction. So that means that in this case, I'm expecting that the server already has the certificate for the client present. This is actually a good way of verifying um, you know, clients as an actual security check if you're doing a limited access service. So if your service only has a few clients that you're expecting to connect to it, then storing the client's certificates in the server's key store is a good secure way of making sure that there's no unauthorized access because only those certificates that are in the server's key store will be usable by that you know, service. Um, so that's the sort of configuration that I have here. If you want to do something where you had a wider range of clients supported, where each client had to have a certificate that had been signed by an authority, recognized by the server or something like that, then you could change this include token to something like, um, uh, what is it, always to recipient, as we saw with the username token. All right, is this stuff making sense to you guys? Okay. 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 All right. Um, include token. This is something we saw in the username token first. This is uh, telling the security configuration how often or when you want to have this uh, this token sent, included in the message. Right. So this means every message you send will include the username. Yes. Everything sent to the server will include the username token. Exactly. Yes. So that the server already knows the certificate. And instead, we have this require thumbprint reference here. That's saying that we're going to send what's called a thumbprint of the certificate to identify it to the server. Exactly. Yep. So uh, like I said, it's a good way of making sure that you, you don't have to worry about unauthorized clients, um, even if they have a signed certificate because the server is not going to accept them anyway. So if you have a limited access service, this is a good way of handling it. The downside is the administrative overhead of actually going into the key store and changing it if your client changes or clients change. All right, so this asymmetric binding, we have the initiator token and recipient token. We have an algorithm suite. In this case, it's basic 128. Well, that's using AES encryption, 128-bit um, uh, strength which is really pretty much a, a recommended approach. I would, I would say it's probably about the best that um, you can get for general purposes. The, um, the encryption strengths vary. Uh, AES encryption starts at 128. It also has 196 and 256. But there's some theoretical reasons why those other variations are not necessarily that much stronger, even though they're, they're using much bigger keys. So the 128-bit encryption is probably um, all you need to, to worry about using for any time soon anyway, put it that way. Um, let's see, layout, this policy strict, I've never seen that actually be an issue with anything. I include it just because most uh, other examples include it, but it's not really necessary. It means that the actual policy has to be in a particular Order. If we look, go to it, let me actually, let me look in the, uh, here. Oh, I need to search. Oh, come on. The only problem is with this uh, slanted, here we go. This slanted podium, it makes it a little tough to use the mouse at times. Okay, um, strict items are added to the security header following the numbered layout rules described below according to the general purpose of declare before use. So it really affects the construction of the security headers. And strict is probably a good thing to use. It's not, I, I don't think anybody has problems though with lax ones either these days. It was originally intended as a simplification just so that the security code would not have to worry about forward references to, for instance, you know, having a, a signature block before the corresponding uh, you know, token or something like that. 
So it's just avoiding forward references. Um, what else? Include timestamp. Well, anytime you're using signing in messages, you definitely want to include timestamps because uh, uh, timestamps are the only things that prevent replay attacks. If you, um, uh, if you have somebody who captures messages and uh, you know, wants to reuse them without a timestamp, they they're able to do that. A timestamp doesn't totally prevent that. Well, actually, if, if it's done properly, it does. And we'll get into that in a moment when we get to actually looking at the message. Only sign entire headers and body. This is kind of a best practices thing. Um, it's really a restriction on the policy itself, though. It's saying this policy should only define signature components that are either the entire body or entire headers of a, a message. Then in the signed and encrypted parts, in this case, I'm just using body. All right. Now, um, it's 20 after 10, so let's take just like a 10-minute a break and uh, grab coffee, take the restroom break if you want, and then we'll resume at uh, 1030, okay? Oh, okay. What file are you? Oh, weird. Okay. Um, IntelliJ, I guess, yeah. Uh -huh. There we are. Live again. Okay. So I gave you a quick rundown of the actual um, WSDL there. Now let's take a look at that again. I, I'm going to change the client and server to use this WSDL now. So it's a library um, asim sign encrypt. Let me change the code to use it. So ASYM sign ENCR. Is that right? ASYM, S-I-N-G, ENCR. Okay. And then the same for the client parameter. Okay. Now, this is where it gets interesting with all the configuration stuff. So I'll run library so simple again. And then run the client again. Ah, I got an error. So what went wrong here? We have Signature or decryption was invalid. Okay. Well, one thing that you'll find in working with web services with security is that oftentimes the message that goes to the client is minimally informative. And that's deliberate because 
uh, a lot of attacks rely on getting feedback from the server to break encryption. Um, so when you're working with a um, you know, web service that is using encryption, typically you have to have access to the server-side logs to find out what's going wrong when something does happen on the server. So if I go there, ah, okay, I have an expired certificate. Ah, boy, that's not fun. I'm going to have to regenerate my certificates then to use it. Well, the actual message, the SOAP message, okay. What the client saw, wait, what the client saw was the signature or decryption was invalid. Standard message that just means that, no, I don't like what you sent me, I'm not going to tell you why. The server then, I can see that, okay, the certificate's expired. So I need to regenerate my certificates. I wish I'd uh, tried this before break. I would have done it while we were doing the break. At this point, I'm not sure I'll bother. Um, yes, I was going to bring that up next. So let's take a look at that. Here, actually, maybe it'd be easier. In this case, I'm going to plug it in and, and format it nicely so that we can uh, see it in a little bit more detail because the Format there was not very clean. And we're going to go through several parts of this. And let me just make sure it's formatted consistently. Okay. So here's the actual SOAP message that went out over the wire. Um, it has, starting from the front, well, the security header, but starting within that then, it has a timestamp with uh, created and expires. And you'll see that the, in this case, the difference between the two is five minutes. That's uh, standard for, um, that's pretty much, a, that's the standard default value for CXF. Now normally if you're doing this, if you really want to make things secure, you would also add in I think you'd add in a nonce as well so that it can be uh, stored and, and checked for duplicates. But in any case, this one has a timestamp that's only valid for five minutes. The next thing in the message is this encrypted key structure. Well, the encrypted key is how you're telling the server what secret key is being used for the message. So encrypted key is a wrapper around a secret key uh, using a public key to secure it. So in this case, it's using this encryption method, this RSA, OA, EP. It's a key exchange algorithm, basically. And it says key info with a key identifier. If I go down to the end here, it says value type is a thumbprint SHA-1, and then this is the actual value. So if you remember from the policy, we said we were going to use thumbprint references for the uh, for the uh, key identifiers or for the certificates or whatever. So in this case, that's identifying the server certificate. So the client is referencing the server certificate, which contains the public key. It's using that public key to encrypt a secret key. Now it seems like a lot of trouble. The reason for doing that is because secret keys used for symmetrical encryption are much faster than asymmetrical encryption. For the same key length, you get much better security. So um, the actual encryption of data and the actual d uh, signing of data in um, WS security always uses secret keys. The public-private key pairs are only used to secure the exchange of secret keys, basically. So that's what we have here. We have a secret key that's being wrapped and signed or encrypted using the server certificate so that the server, when it gets this message, can decrypt it and get at the secret key that was used by the client. Then we have the signature block itself. So the signature block identifies uh, what information was signed as the first part, and that includes the canonicalization method. That's just how the XML is turned into binary for, or or how the XML is turned into a standard form for signing. The actual signature method, in this case, 
excuse me, it's RSA and SHA-1, uh, the reference URI that says what is being signed, uh, digest method, and the digest value. So in this case, we have two of these references. Now, these refer to different parts of the message. If I look at what they are, I can uh, look at the ID. Well, I know right off the bat because that's, that's uh, the timestamp because CXF uses the TS dash um, identifier for timestamps. So if I look up here, I can see that yes, indeed, that is a timestamp. So this first reference is signing the, or is calculating a digest value for the timestamp and including that in the signature. The second one, this one here, this reference, is to the body. So if I look down here in the body, it has the identifier in here somewhere. Here it is. Well, no, wait. Um, well, let me look. Oh, it's right on the body, yes. There it is. So this reference is for the body, and it's saying we calculated a digest for the body, and here's the digest value. And then finally, there's a signature value that includes those digests and then references the key that was used for the, the signature generation. So a complex structure and not something that you necessarily want to go through by hand uh, all the time. I'm just showing you this to give you an idea of what's going on behind the scenes and how the policy is actually translated into what you see here in the message. The body of the message then has encrypted data, which is the you know, XML encryption stuff. And that has, in turn, the key information that's used for encryption and the cipher data that actually represents the body of the message. All right. So had my um, certificate not expired, we would have seen the response back from the server as well using the same scheme. Since we don't have that much time, though, I'm going to bypass that and not try and do a new certificate right now. And just continue on. So, any questions about this first example of uh, using security? Okay. Now, um, protection assertions, well, you specify what is protected, signed parts or encrypted parts. Um, I showed you the example of that. It's all pretty, well, if not simple, it's not too complicated anyway, where you tell which parts you want signed and which parts you want encrypted. Now you'll notice that it doesn't have the timestamp included in the signed parts, but the timestamp got signed automatically anyway. That's, um, that's part of the security principles or whatever, that anytime you have anything signed in a message, it's always going to include the timestamp if there's one present. All right. Uh, required header assertions. You can define which headers have to be present in a message. Now, I didn't actually use that in the policy that I'm doing, but you can do that. There's also a bunch of different ways that you can have supporting tokens specified in your um, security policy. Now, uh, I'm not going to go into that a lot, but basically supporting tokens are a way of sending along data that, or, or cryptographically you know, important data that's not actually being used as part of the message signatures or encryption. Uh, cases where you'd use this type of thing include, for instance, if you're identifying yourself with a SAML token service. Uh, you guys ever worked with SAML stuff at all? Okay. It's a nice, sorry? No, you have. Okay. No, that's true. Though it depends on what you're doing. You can't have LDAP adapters, for instance, you know, SAML just going off an LDAP back in, but in general, SAML is pretty complex to work with. Um, but WS Security allows you to include that type of thing in your messages if you want to. You don't have to, of course, in the case that we're talking about or we're seeing, you didn't do that at all. So, token assertions. Um, well, these are the different types of token assertions that are supported by WS Security. We saw a username token, um, X509 token. Well, that's for X509 certificates. 
And that's what we used in our policies here. So we had initiator token and recipient token were both X509 tokens, meaning we're using X509 certificates. That's just a standard certificate format. It's what you'd get from, it's what servers use for uh, SSL and everything like that anyway too. Uh huh. Yeah. Well, it's using Kerberos tokens. I don't think it's actually initiating, you know, it doesn't create Kerberos tokens. It's not a Kerberos token issuer, but it can work with no, Kerberos right. tokens. Oh, okay. Well, I think they're big in the Windows uh, communication. Yeah. 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 And of course, with web services, interoperability are an important part of what you're going for. So, okay, and SAML tokens, HTTPS token, secure conversation token. I'm not really going to talk about secure conversation today because we don't have time for it, but uh, uh, just to kind of run through the options here. The inclusion attribute. We saw this uh, before where you had those different options. We saw always to recipient used for the username token and we saw never used for the um, you know, tokens that we're just working with, the X509 ones. The other options are once, always to initiator, and always. I've never really seen the other ones used that I can remember. Uh, in theory, if you said once, it would only be sent the first time you're, you're sending a message to the, the server. Um, I don't know that anybody actually supports that. A lot of these options that you get in things like WS Security were kind of done by the people at the time saying, oh, that's a cool idea, let's do that, but then nobody ever bothers to implement them because the use cases are too small. Uh, token assertion structure, well, you get the issuer gives the identity of a token issuer, issuer name gives logical name of token issuer, all that sort of thing. So you can specify um, the issuer, for instance, that you want to have for a certificate. So I believe you can anyway. If we look at the X509 certificate again, here's the X509 token. Um, it supports this issuer reference. So I haven't actually checked this, but in theory this should mean that you should be able to specify that you want the uh, certificate to be signed by a particular certificate authority, which is kind of a nice feature to have actually. It's telling the you know, including that in the configuration that you want this to be from a particular place. Um, required derived keys, all this sort of thing. Well, I'm not going to go into that again. It's all WS Secure Conversation stuff. X509. There are different forms of token identifications. Now, I use that thumbprint reference in what I was doing. That's actually not the best approach for interoperability. For interoperability, um, the, the most widely used one is this require issuer serial reference. What that refers to is some fields in the X509 certificate where the issuer, the certificate authority that issued a certificate actually puts a serial number into it. So require issuer serial reference is saying that we're going to actually get that information from it. By way of example, if I change that policy that I had there to, say, require issuer serial reference instead of uh, the one that I had there before and ran it again. Okay, I'm not going to bother restarting the server because it's not going to accept the message anyway. Okay, same message as before, except expected. But now if I look on the uh, server, whereas before I had that uh, digest value for the certificate, now I have issuer name and serial number instead. As I said, that's the more widely used approach. So that's really what I should have had in the WSDL to begin with, and that's what I'll keep in there now. 
So name and serial number is probably a better approach to use for identifying the things. Kerberos token, well, if you're going to use it, you can work with these. Uh, I'm not going to go through the details. SAML token, same sort of thing. HTTPS token. I'll just skip over these unless you guys have some particular interest in them. Symmetric binding. Um, difference between asymmetric binding and symmetric binding is that with a symmetric binding, you don't need a client certificate. So depending on what you're doing, symmetric bindings can be a lot more convenient. You don't have to uh, worry with the symmetric binding about issuing and configuring certificates for every client. You can still just work off the server certificate, basically. Any questions about this or anything related to it? OK. Uh, algorithm suite, well, I mentioned that before. Again, it doesn't really matter too much. Um, basic 128 should be fine for everything you need to, to do. If you have to work with something else, then you just set it in there and it should work OK. Um, WSDL details, well, I'm not going to bother going through that. But attaching policies, all right. Um, now, I showed you references using this WSP policy reference. You can also embed policies directly into the WSDL. So as an alternative to what I did in the, the policy here, where I have the policy as a standalone you know, component and then referenced, I could instead copy the whole thing and plug it in directly. You see this being done in some cases. It's not, uh, you know, it's not the preferred approach, at least I wouldn't think it is. But some of the older things do do this. Wait, why didn't that work? What I meant to do was copy the entire thing here. And plug it in here. All right. So you can embed the policy directly within the binding or wherever you want to put it and just use it that way without doing a reference. Reference is usually the better approach, though. Sorry, let me just correct my policy so I have it saved in a good state. All right. Now, in theory, you are supposed to attach policies of different types at different levels. Um, so the message level, if you're attaching something at an individual message, you can do protection assertions and required header assertions along with supporting token assertions. So protection assertions, that means that you can specify signing and encryption of messages at the message level. Um, and supporting token assertions, so username token is a supporting token. So I could, if I wanted to, specify that username tokens, for instance, are only going to be used for certain messages and not for all of them. You can specify at the operation level uh, symmetric binding, asymmetric binding, supporting token assertions, all that. Uh, and at binding or port level, um, all binding assertions, supporting token assertions, WS security version assertions. Okay. Let me take a quick example of that. So currently, I had that signing encryption policy reference at the binding level. Now if I instead move that down to, let's say I'm only going to require signing encryption when you're adding a book. I'll save that off. Now if I run the client again, oh, what happened? Body not signed, body not encrypted. Huh. Oh, okay, the um, I need to restart the server because he's going to be expecting it. What happened there was I had the server still using the old policy which was attached at the binding level. 
meaning that it applied to all operations. And when the server didn't receive the messages, I got these different errors. It says body not signed, body not encrypted, uh, received timestamp, does not match requirements. So it's checking all the requirements of the policy and not finding them. Okay, so one more time with the client. Okay, so what happened this time is it ran through all the different types of operations until it got to trying to add a book. When it tried to add a book, it included the, uh, you know, it did the signing encryption, but we ran into that same problem with the certificate being out of date. So I changed the policy so that the only thing that was requiring signing encryption was the add book operation by putting the policy reference down here in the ad book. Is that clear? So the nice thing about this is that you don't have to specify things like signing encryption for all your operations. If you only have one operation that you really need the security on, you can just define it on that and not have the overhead of security for the other operations that you're doing. All right, our managing policy, merging policies. Yeah, okay, if, um, if you have policies at different levels, they basically cascade. So you can, um, you know, you can find that every message has to have, I don't know, signing encryption, but some only, only some of them need username token, something like that. Now I have an example here, but I already showed you the basics of it, so I'm not gonna worry about that. Um, policy references can be external as well. So you can use an external policy and just reference it from the WSDL that's most often done in like larger organizations where you might have central control policies, that sort of deal. WS addressing, okay. Uh, WS addressing is a standard that allows putting additional information to messages to identify the messages and what they're doing and where they're going to. The messages that we've seen so far were just done using plain old um, uh, you know, security in some cases, but we weren't using any WS addressing stuff in here. Now, what WS addressing does is it assigns identifiers to individual messages and also includes things like the to information, the from information, reply to, and the actual action that you want performed on the, you know, by the service or whatever. This is uh, useful for a lot of purposes, um, including for asynchronous responses and queuing systems. Uh, WS Reliable Messaging can use it as well. It's also useful for WS Security. Uh, if you just sign messages and, and encrypt messages in isolation, then there's always the possibility that somebody could capture one of those messages and replay it in uh, you know, a different context somewhere else and perhaps cause you problems. With WS addressing, you can also include in the message itself the to and from information. That makes it harder to misuse a message because um, you know, everything is already embedded in it that says exactly what you want to do. So with normal operations, the to and from and the action are all implicit in the HTTP request. You guys know what I mean by that? Have you seen uh, HTTP requests for SOAP web services? That's true, they are. But the headers, the HTTP headers include the action that you're going to perform and all that sort of thing. So WS addressing gives you a cleaner approach to that um, because it allows you to um, you know, embed this information directly into the message and then you can have it signed if you're doing signing. So addressing a policy uses a single assertion, um, this WS addressing one. It does allow nested policies for further requirements, so I'm not gonna get into examples of that. Now I have an assignment here to actually turn on WS addressing. Um, let me just show you an example of that in operation. Let's see, we're going along pretty quickly here. I've only got another 10 slides left, so I guess when we get done with that, um, I'll do a demonstration of 
reliable messaging, then it's up to you guys what you want to do for the remaining time. So you can go through stuff. Okay, let's see. So we have, um, I want to put in a policy for addressing. Let me do that. Space as well. Let's see. Okay, so I've added a WS addressing uh, assertion to my policy here. So now when I uh, do an operation, uh, when I try this again, I should see the addressing headers in place. Let's go ahead and do that. And uh, let's see, I'll need to restart the server as well so that it doesn't reject the messages. If I look at the messages that were sent in then, here for instance is the, uh, the first one. So now with that addressing assertion in place, um, I have these addressing headers in the message. An action, message ID, to, reply to. Um, so the action identifies the type of operation that's going to be done by this message. The message ID is a unique identifier for the message, which makes it easy to check for duplicates because uh, they are unique. So you can easily just maintain a cache over the life of the timestamp and reject any messages that are, you know, received as duplicates. To and reply to. Um, now in the security, let's see, right now I don't have any, uh, any information being signed aside from the timestamp and uh, the actual body of the message. You should always include the addressing headers in the signature. So if I wanted to do that, I would add a um, signing component to it. So if I go into that WSDL one more time, and I can add to the signed blocks or signed parts an SP colon headers. And uh, let's see, I believe it's NS equals. Well, let me double check on that. Uh, signed parts. Header. Okay, so it's header and namespace. Both of them initial uppercase. So header and namespace. All right, so what that's going to do is it's going to hopefully add signing of the namespaces to my messages. So if I run it one more time, I'll just run the client. The server is going to reject it anyway. Whoops, wrong one here. 
So if I run the client, and then we'll take a look at the generated message. All right, so um, now I should see uh, that the WS addressing headers are also included in the signature. Now, if I look down here, whereas before I just had two signature or two reference blocks, one for the timestamp and one for the message body, now I have a whole bunch of them, one for each of the uh, WS addressing headers. Okay, so the headers each have an ID on them. such as this, that was added by the handling for the signature generation, and then those are referenced in the references. Oh, well, sign the WS addressing hitters, yeah. The policy that I added was to say, sign any header that's from this namespace. And again, that is the policy that you want to use when you're using uh, signing on messages. You want to include the, uh, the headers in there, the addressing headers. All right, so that's uh, WS addressing. Now, um, the full list of w uh, CXF security parameters, you can see at this location, let me, uh, it's not gonna copy it, is it? Here, let me do it this way, come on. Okay, so let's see if I can bring it up. All right, so here's the full list of parameters that are defined. We've worked with a few of these already. Um, username is the user's name, which is um, used differently by different security assertions. For username tokens, what actually goes into the username token. Uh, for other types of operations, it's used differently. Password is the user's password if you want to embed it directly in a configuration file or if you want to set it directly on the client. Now these are properties, so you can set them as properties directly on the client object that you're using in CXF as well. Likewise with all the other ones. Username for signature, username for encryption, uh, crypto callback properties, the list goes on for quite a ways here. Uh, the main ones that you need to worry about are the ones I include in the slides, but this is the whole list if you ever want to you know, get into it in more detail. So this tells you everything that you can configure on CXF basically for security handling. Now the other link that I give you in the slides is for this uh, Microsoft.NET security configurations. And we'll just take a quick look at those. Um, now the reason that I refer people to this is because, first off, it's one of the few collections of security policies that you can find anywhere on the net that are like organized in one place. And secondly, because if you're concerned about interoperability, um, Microsoft is more likely to have a problem with policies that you construct than other frameworks. You know, Microsoft is very insular and uh, parochial when it comes to supporting standards. So basically they test the stuff that they intend to use and they don't test very much with other people. Um, that's too. So in this case, um, they give you a bunch of common configurations or whatever that you can use. So if you're looking for a security policy, this isn't a bad place to come to to find one. Uh, username over transport, for instance, uh, what does it say here? It's a uh, uh, sign supporting token that's always sent from the initiator to the recipient. Service is authenticated using an X509 certificate transport layer. Well, what that means is TLS. So let me copy this guy off. I wish they wouldn't embed him that way. 
would have hurt him so much to just use a little more space for it, but okay. So if I paste this and format it so it's actually readable, okay. Um, of course, they don't have all the namespaces defined, which makes it more difficult too. But here's the basic policy definition that they give you. It's a transport token uh, for transport binding. So all it's saying is that we're using a tra uh, an HTTPS uh, you know, connection, and you're going to be sending a username token over that. All right. One of the simpler examples, they give you a bunch of other examples in here too. Let's see, uh, issued token for transport, um, X509 certificates for a service authentication. So they give an example, mutual certificate, WSS 1.0. Um, so some different, uh, different examples that you might want to try. And they also give you, in some cases, the generated messages that you get as a result of these. Let's take a look at one that's a little bit more complex here. All right, so here's an asymmetric binding. Initiator token is always to recipient. Well, this is because they're using mutual um, you know, client and server certificates, which an asymmetric binding requires, and they're not assuming that the server already has a certificate in its key store. Anything else of interest? They're using basic 256 encryption. Um, yeah. Encrypt before signing, only sign entire headers and bodies. Nothing much else there of interest. Okay. So they give you a collection here. I'm not going to go through them in any more detail, but just so you know, it's not a bad place to look for examples of, uh, of security policies that you can use in your own configurations as well. Since security policy is a standard, anything that works for Microsoft is probably going to work elsewhere, except that sometimes they have Microsoft-specific extensions in, the, um, in there, and you have to watch out for those. All right, reliable messaging. Um, Reliable messaging has been around for, for quite a while. I think the submission version was back around 2005, which was a big time for all these WS standards or, or WS proposed standards. Um, in this case, the WS original proposed standard was widely implemented, but then changed without, um, without any notification or whatever. CXF originally implemented the uh, the original proposal. Now the problem is that everybody else also supported the original proposal, but they'd made a change to it. Um, WS addressing became standardized back in um, 2005, I think it was, somewhere there. And all the other implementations of WS reliable messaging changed to use the new namespace that had been defined by the by the later standard. Um, CXF stayed with the older one. So as a result of that, CXF's reliable messaging wasn't compatible with anybody else. Now, I had made changes to it back a couple of years ago to improve that situation. So um, I, I put in an interoperable form of WS reliable messaging for CXF then. Since then, I've also extended it to work with the latest WS Reliable Messaging Standard, which is 1.2. Now, they don't give me a drawing board here or anything to, uh, to draw on, I guess, so I can't show you. But what it comes down to is that there are three different configurations that CXF supports in terms of WS Reliable Messaging, and it's smart about it. The server will automatically adapt to whatever the client uses in terms of uh, WS Reliable Messaging version. So, um, the first one is the original form of WS Reliable Messaging as proposed initially by Microsoft and IBM using the old WS Addressing namespace from that time. The second one is basically the same thing except updated to use the newer WS Addressing namespace. And the third one is the version 1.2 Reliable Messaging. So, uh, CXF supports all three. 
and it's at least somewhat interoperable. We're tr still trying some of the interoperability configurations to make sure those all work, hopefully in time for the 3.0 release. The basic concept of reliable messaging is that it provides a reliable end-to-end -end transport. So you have the application source and application destination, and then you have the RM source and destination that act as reliable you know, intermediaries to deliver the stuff through. So all the actual handshaking, everything involved in reliable exchanges is done at this RM level without the application actually having to know about it especially. Um, so the goal is to support reliable message exchange. You have guaranteed delivery and ordering features which can be used separately or together. Now, it's basically like any other message queuing system. You have to have messages held by the sender until they're acknowledged and you have to have some sort of form of persistent storage if you want robust operation. Meaning that if you want to have the messages preserved even over a restart. Um, you can do that with CXF. It has the option for persistent storage using a database or whatever you want to use and um, will store the messages until they're actually acknowledged and uh, you know, successfully received. No, I don't believe there is. Yeah. It could be implemented. I'm sure, I'm sure Sergey would be willing. He seems to put everything into there that he can, uh, he can find. So uh, if he managed to get the WF security on um, RS stuff, then he could certainly get the RM working on it too, I'm sure. Okay, so let's see. So all the mess issues of uh, typical message queuing systems. Uh, well, WS Reliable Messaging operates over top of the client-server message exchange. Um, we'll take an example of that in just a moment. Maybe I'm better off just showing you that way. Uh, in fact, I will. So let's take a look at that. Let's see, this gives you an example, but it's too complex to read. All right. Let me go ahead and show you an example in operation here. I've got here a, uh, a client and, and server both running on CXF. And in this case, I've actually got them uh, set up to work through TCPmon. You guys know about TCPmon? Similar. It's an intermediary. So it, uh, it allows you to um, act as a, it acts as a proxy so that basically you talk to it on the client side, it talks to the server on your behalf, and it um, tracks everything that you send or receive. So it's a little bit easier than using logs for some of these complex configurations. Okay, so if I run my um, client here, let's see. Test sign mirror, okay, let me try that. And uh, yeah, a lot of stuff going on here. Received response, password callbacks, all that sort of thing. I'll go through in detail. Oh yeah, here's a message loss. I'm actually throwing away some of these messages before they get sent so that I can show the uh, RM in operation. You won't see it in the TCP mon log, but uh, it's, it's showing up in the uh, logs here and we'll take a look at it in a moment when it finishes. So it's actually sending like six messages, five or six messages separate out in time. I think it's finally about done. We'll use a, take a look at the TCP mod stuff to see the actual form of the messages, and then I'll show you in the logs the uh, operation of the retransmit and all that sort of thing. So here's a message that's being sent out. Now it has those WS addressing headers that we talked about just before. It has the WS security stuff, including signatures and all that stuff, all the references and everything. And somewhere in here, it also has, okay, well, this one is actually a create sequence message. Now, this create sequence 
is being done as part of the RM protocol. The action code in the uh, addressing header specifies this particular identifier here, this WSRM uh, 20702 create sequence. That's the uh, create sequence operation defined by the RM protocol. So this isn't an application message at all, even though it's being sent over the same channel. It's a message for the RM protocol handling. And it's identified as such by that header. The message itself is this create sequence. What create sequence does, well, a sequence is just that. It's a sequence of messages that you're going to be sending. And within a sequence, each message has a unique sequence number, starting at one. And um, you know, they go on forever, basically, until you close the sequence or otherwise get rid of it. So the create sequence message is the ARM protocol telling the other end that it wants to get started on sending a, a message across. The response to that comes back. Boy, with all the signing stuff in place and everything, it's a little bit messy here. But uh, here's the create sequence response. And it basically says that it's accepting it. And yes, we're all good to go. So on the client side again, the next message, well, I have it uh, signed here, but we can still read the body. And it's actually the message number one that's going to the server. In this case, it's not the library stuff. It's just a simple reflection callback or thing. But in the headers, in addition to the headers that we saw before, there's now this RM sequence header. What the RM sequence header does is it says, this message is part of a sequence that we've got going. And the identifier is such, and it gives a long identifier string. And the message number is 1. So it's the first message in this sequence. The response from the server then has its own sequence identifier, because the responses are also a part of a sequence. In this case, we're doing RM in both directions. And it also has a sequence acknowledgment. <clears throat> so it's acknowledging the message from the client and also sending its own response message, also with a uh, signature enabled and everything. Now, in order to see the actual RM stuff in operation, what I'm going to do is change my parameters here. I have the, um, the client set up to run with a particular um, timing value between messages. I just wanted to check what those values are. Let's see. So I have um, parameters are interval and count. OK. So I had this set up to use an interval of um, five seconds and a count of six messages. I'm going to reduce that interval down to one second. So this should show us a bunch of retransmits and everything. This is actually a 3.0 code that I'm running now because this has improvements for the RM operation. So let's see what happens with this. Now, it went through the whole sequence there, but it went through them out of order. If I look at the actual recorded messages here, um, let's see. This would have been the first one. So here's message two. I should have turned off signing for this example. It would have made things a lot simpler in here. So here's sequence one, and then sequence two. We should see some out of order here, though, hopefully. There's two. The other messages in between are the acknowledgments going back and forth, because there's uh, 
acknowledgments in both directions as well. Here's three. Four. All right, well, I'm not seeing them out of order. I'll have to, yeah, okay. So it looks like they're all being sent in order, unfortunately. That wasn't what I intended here. Um, all right, well, I'm not going to go through more details of it. You've seen the basic operation anyway. At the end of the sequence, when you're done with everything else, uh, it's up to the endpoints to close the sequence off so that it doesn't keep on taking up resources on the server. So uh, that was a improvement that also went into 3.0 where it does start doing things correctly uh, now with the closing. And here's a closed sequence message, for instance, with that. All right, so I've run through my slides. Um, we have about a half hour left. Uh, what would you guys like to, to see or discuss, or what do you want to do? Were you able to get it running on, on yours, Stacy? No, oh, sorry. Uh-huh. Well, Matt, you got yours running okay, right? Okay. Well, you've got the files. Let me give you the other file with the... Um, the slides were the original... The slides were on the... Yeah. Yeah, you got the slides. Here, I think the only thing I didn't put on there for you was... Yeah. The one with all the, um, with WS addressing on it and stuff too. Oh, yeah. There's a big increase in message size, especially for smaller messages. Um, there's a, you know, where you can literally get like 10 or 20 times the size of a message uh, from having WS security on. Yes, exactly. All those headers. Yeah. So that obviously has some component of this. Oh, yes. Yeah, there's limited amount that can be done with performance config, uh, considerations. Part of the problem is that WS Security was not designed with performance in mind. Sure. Part of the problem is that some of the companies involved in designing WS Security are ones that build appliances that you attach onto your network to offload the processing. Right. So, you know, let's say that there were some conflicts of interest in some way oh, in sure. doing that. So, WS Security um, does have a lot of overhead and there's no clean ways around it. The one alternative that does offer some possibility is um, changing to something called authenticated encryption. Right now, um, you effectively have to both sign and encrypt every message in order to get security on it. The problem is that if you don't sign stuff, even if you encrypt it, uh, somebody could tweak the, the data in transit, and there's a chance, at least, that it would still be valid XML. I mean, if they, if they tweak something, the way these encryption protocols work is that the modification is going to be confined to a block of like 16 you know, characters or something. And um, um, because of that, if it happens to hit in the middle of your data, it could be a valid modification that would still parse as valid XML, okay? So you have to sign stuff as well in order to make sure that nobody has tampered with it. And that means that you have all this overhead of serializing it out in a canonical form and running the digest and everything like that. The one thing that offers the potential for some performance increases in that is 
going to a authenticated encryption mode where you wouldn't have to sign messages anymore because the encryption would actually track um, you know, basically a digest of the values. And there is such a mode, it's called GCM for a Galois counter mode um, encryption. The problem is that it's relatively new to be a popular encryption technique and it's not part of the WS security policy standard. Um, it's part of WS security, but you can't configure it at the policy level in normal, you know, interoperable policies. CXF, you can configure it at the policy level. CXF has a CXF specific extension. But from what I've seen so far, it's disappointing. It doesn't actually deliver much better performance than the uh, old form. It would at least reduce your message sizes though, because you wouldn't have the whole signature block you would only have the encryption block then. But that's it's the. Different oh, yeah, it is. Oh, yes, it does. So, like, one of our clients, when we were working with them, said, look, this will be like this. <clears throat> and they're like, okay, it tells us when we're going to do this. Let's do our, our F5 load balancers. We'll put in um, a two-way over telephone cable. Mm -hmm. And then everything else is free and clear. And they're like, sounds good to me. Once that handshake is there, then we're good. Yep. Yeah, if you're just doing point-to-point -point stuff, then uh, TLS is probably a better alternative than WS Security in almost every case. Um, WS Security and... That's true. Yeah. Yeah. But uh, the overhead is enormous. Uh, yeah, doing like 10, 10 request responses per second is pretty good performance using WS Security, whereas uh, without it, you could be doing 100 or you know, more. Um, so it has a you know, big I mean, impact. Right. So, I mean, don't want to discard it just because it doesn't work for, for a bulk sure. board. I mean, there are obvious places where it fails as well as malware. Yes. Or other, you know, other approaches. Um, it just so happens that, you know, my current task, you know, these past four years, six, seven, eight, nine months has been very high volume. So, um, you know, hopefully I can sort of put that to bed and, you know, look at things that are not as Uh-huh. <laughs> well, this was a great talk. I appreciate it. Okay. Uh, which, you know, sorry there weren't more attendees, but, you know, I appreciate yeah, it. Yeah, well, it's the last day. I think everybody's going <laughs> to drink beer. And yeah. Drink. Well, like I said, they, uh, they had disappointingly few people for the tutorials in general. They, uh, the one yesterday, I think they may have had three for that, but that was it as well. So it's been pretty limited.